Our readings today will be taken from the book Desire of Ages, one of my favorite books on the life of Christ. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. The Savior's coming was foretold in Eden. When Adam and Eve first heard the promise, they looked for its speedy fulfillment. They joyfully welcomed their firstborn son, hoping that he might be the deliverer. But the fulfillment of the promise tarried. Those who first received it died without sight. From the days of Noah, the promise was repeated through the patriarchs and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the time of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away. The voices of the prophets ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, The days are prolonged, and every vision fails. But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's purposes know no haste and no delay. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Providence had directed the movements of nations and the tide of human impulse and influence until the world was ripe for the coming of the Deliverer. The nations were united under one government. One language was widely spoken and was everywhere recognized as the language of literature. From all lands, the Jews of the dispersion gathered to Jerusalem to the annual feasts. As these returned to the places of their sojourn, they could spread throughout the world the tidings of the Messiah's coming. Through nature, through types and shadows, through patriarchs and prophets, God had spoken to the world. Lessons must be given to humanity in the language of humanity. The messenger of the covenant must speak. His voice must be heard in his own temple. Christ must come to utter words which should be clearly and definitely understood. He, the author of truth, must separate truth from the shape of man's utterance, which had made it of no effect. The principles of God's government and the plan of redemption must be clearly defined. The lessons of the Old Testament must be fully set before men. Among the Jews, there were yet steadfast souls, descendants of the holy line, through whom a knowledge of God had been preserved. These still looked for the hope of the promise made unto the fathers. We'll sing at this time, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, for the songs that we sang as a congregation will remain seated. In the hymnal, that's number 115115, or the words will be on the screen.
The deception of sin had reached its height. All the agencies of depraving the soul of men had been put in operation. The Son of God looked upon the world, beholding suffering and misery with pity. He saw how men had become victims of satanic cruelty. He looked with compassion upon those who were being corrupted, murdered, and lost. They had chosen a ruler who chained them to his car as captives. Bewildered and deceived, they were moving on in gloomy procession toward eternal ruin, to death in which is no hope of life, toward night in which comes no morning. Satanic agencies were incorporated with men the bodies of human beings made for the dwelling place of God had become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, the passions, the organs of men were worked by supernatural agencies in the indulgence of the vilest lust. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenance of men. Human faces reflected the expression of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. Such was the prospect upon which the world's Redeemer looked. What a spectacle for infinite purity to behold. It was demonstrated before the universe that apart from God, humanity could not be uplifted. A new element of life and power must be imparted by him who made the world. With intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan of securing to himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. He had declared that the principles of God's government made forgiveness impossible. Had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusations were proven true. He was ready to cast blame upon God and to spread his rebellion to the worlds above. But instead of destroying the world, God sent his son to save it. Though corruption and defiance might be sin in every part of the alien province. A way for its recovery was provided. At the very crisis, when Satan seemed about to triumph, the Son of God came with the embassage of divine grace. Through every age, through every hour, 
The love of God had been exercised toward the fallen race. Notwithstanding the perversity of men, the signals of mercy had been continually exhibited. And when the fullness of time had come, the deity was glorified by pouring upon the world a flood of healing grace that was never to be obstructed or withdrawn till the plan of salvation had been fulfilled. The king of glory stooped low to take humanity. Rude and forbidding were his earthly surroundings. His glory was veiled that the majesty of his outward form might not become an object of attraction. He shunned all outward display, riches, worldly honor, Human greatness can never save a soul from death. Je Jesus purposed that no attraction of an earthly nature should call men to his side. Only the beauty of heavenly truth must draw those who would follow him. The character of the Messiah had long been foretold in prophecy, and he desired men to accept him upon the testimony of the word of God. Already the forerunner, John the Baptist, was born. 
his mission attested by miracle and prophecy. The tidings of his birth and the wonderful significance of his mission had been spread abroad, yet Jerusalem was not preparing to welcome her Redeemer. With amazement, the heavenly messengers beheld the indifference of that people whom God had called to communicate to the world the light of sacred truth. The Jewish nation had been preserved as a witness that Christ was to be born of the seed of Abraham and of David's line. Yet they knew not that his coming was now at hand. Hearts selfish and world engrossed were untouched by the joy that thrilled all heaven. Only a few were longing to behold the unseen. To these, heaven's embassy was sent. At this point, we'll sing hymn number 118, the first Noel.
Angels attend Joseph and Mary as they journey from their home in Nazareth to the city of David. The decree of Imperial Rome for the enrollment of peoples of her vast dominion has extended to the dwellers among the hills of Galilee. As in old time, Cyrus was called to the throne of the world's empire that he might set free the captives of the Lord. So Caesar Augustus is made the agent for the fulfillment of God's purpose in bringing the mother of Jesus to Bethlehem. She is of the lineage of David, and the son of David must be born in David's city. Out of Bethlehem, said the prophet, shall he come forth, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. But the city of their royal line, Joseph and Mary, are unrecognized and unhonored, weary and homeless. They traverse the entire length of the narrow street, from the gate of the city to the eastern extremity of the town, vainly seeking a resting place for the night. There is no room for them at the crowded inn, and a rude building where the beasts are sheltered. They at last find refuge, and here the Redeemer of the world is born.
Men know it not, but the tidings filled heaven with rejoicing. With a deeper and more tender interest, the holy beings from the world of light are drawn to the earth. The whole world is brighter for his presence. Above the hills of Bethlehem are gathered an innumerable throng of angels. They wake the signal to declare the glad news to the world. Had the leaders in Israel been true to their trust, they might have shared the joy of heralding the birth of Jesus, but now they are passed by. To those who are seeking for light and who accept it with gladness, the bright rays from the throne of God will shine. Let us sing together, Joy to the World, number 125. In the fields where the boy David had led his flock, shepherds were still keeping watch by night. Through the silent hours they talked together of the promised Savior and prayed for the coming King to David's throne. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. At these words, visions of glory filled the minds of the listening shepherds. The Deliverer has come to Israel. Power, exaltation, triumph are associated with his coming. But the angel must prepare them to recognize their Savior in poverty and humiliation. This shall be a sign unto you, he says. 
You shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The heavenly messenger had quieted their fears. He had told them how to find Jesus. With tender regard to their human weaknesses, he had given them time to become accustomed to the divine radiance. Then the joy and glory could no longer be hidden. The whole plain was lighted up with the bright shining of the hosts of God. Earth was hushed and heaven stopped to listen to the song. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Let us join together in singing Hark the Herald Angels Sang, number 122. As the angels disappeared, the light faded away, and the shadows of night once more fell on the hills of Bethlehem. But the brightest picture ever beheld by the human eye remained in the memory of the shepherds. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. Departing with great joy, they made known the things that they had seen and heard. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, 
glorifying and praising God. children see him lily white the baby jesus born this night some children see him lily white with tresses soft and fair some children see him bronzed and brown, the Lord of heaven to earth come down. Some children see him bronzed and brown, with dark and heavy. Some children see him arm and eyed, this Savior whom we kneel beside. Some children see him arm and eyed, with skin of yellow hue. Some children see him dark as they, sweet Mary's son, to whom we pray. Some children see him dark as they, and all oh, they love him too. The children in each different place will see the baby Jesus face like theirs, but bright with heavenly grace and filled with hope. Oh, lay aside each earthly thing, and with thy heart as offering, come worship now the infant King. Tis love that's born to Heaven and earth are no wider apart today than when shepherds listened to the angel's song. The story of Bethlehem is an exhaustless theme. In it is hidden the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. We marvel at the Savior's sacrifice in exchanging the throne of heaven for the manger and the companionship of adoring angels for the beasts of the stall. Human pride and self-sufficiently stand rebuked in his presence. Yet, this was but the, but the beginning of his wonderful condescension. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. 
What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. The heart of the human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict, to meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk. God gave his only begotten son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Heaven Herein is love, wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. Let's stand together and sing number 132, O come, O ye faithful. Father in heaven, we marvel at the thought that our creator, Jesus Christ, would step down from his throne in heaven, be born in a manger, become one of us, come to a world darkened in sin, leave the fellowship of adoring angels and come to a place where he would be so misunderstood, persecuted, and finally crucified. But we thank you so much, Lord, for your willingness to come. It tells us truly how much you love us. 
And I pray that whenever Satan whispers in any of our ears that God does not love us, may we never forget the sacrifice that you were willing to make, Jesus, to step from your throne and come here. And if there be one here today that you know in your heart you never accepted that babe born in the manger in Bethlehem so many years ago, you've never accepted him as your Savior. If there be such a one, and through this service today you have felt the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart, if there be such a one, I invite you right now to lift your heart to God in prayer and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I would invite every one of us in the quietness of prayer to lift our hearts to God as well and say thank you. And I renew my relationship with you, Jesus. Thank you. You came that I might be with you forever. Thank you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Hi, I'm Dennis Smith, pastor of the Clearview Seventh Avenue Church. We're located at 19554 North Papaco Drive in Surprise, Arizona. The major focus in our church is, of course, on Jesus Christ and also on prayer and the Holy Spirit. I find it interesting that when Christ gave us what's called the Lord's Prayer, as part of that prayer, we were to ask the Father that His will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And that's fascinated me for years. And it had a major impact in my life and as a pastor to realize that when God wants something done in this world, it's absolutely essential that we as Christians ask Him to do it. And that gives Him the rite of passage. So in our church here in Surprise, we have as our mission statement to be spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, and spirit-led. I'd like to invite you to visit us when you're in our area. Our Sabbath school service begins at 9.20 on Saturday morning, and our worship service begins at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning. Hope to see you then. <laughs>